1995, director Martin Campbell and star Pierce Brosnan gave the world the latest iteration of the world's sexiest spy. In 2024, we go globetrotting with an exotic finished whiskey. The film is Goldeneye. The whiskey is Saints Alley, The Nobleman. And we'll review them both. This is the, the Film and Whiskey Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. Brad, I cannot withhold my excitement for this stretch of the season. <laughs> I like let let us remind our listeners of the the run that we're on right now. Dude. So in in back to back consecutive weeks, we did The Fugitive and True Lies. Today we are watching Goldeneye. And then yes, we're sir. we're capping it off with let's see what are the next couple of weeks Independence Day, Men in Black, and Armageddon. People it, could not get enough violent movies. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is: Is there a better time to be alive than right now watching these movies in a row, Brad? Dude, I am not gonna lie. These have just been a run of really incredible action films. And like, you know, The Fugitive is a drama first, action second, but man, oh man, is it tense and keeps you on the edge of your seat. True Lies was a wild experience, Bob. I did not expect what I was getting my first time through that movie. And here we are with Goldeneye, a movie that, Bob, I feel really uniquely positioned to watch because I grew up with Casino Royale on, right? Mm -hmm. Daniel Mm -hmm. Craig... Uh, I didn't like Quantum of Solace, but other than that, I, I really liked the Daniel Craig movies. I also grew up watching a few of the really old Sean Connery, 60s and 70s James Bond. And I had always heard that the the Pierce Brosnan ones leaned way more into the silly. At least that's what how my dad told the story. I don't think I was ready for the bridge that Goldeneye is between like old school Bond and Daniel Craig Bond. Because I think it's much more of a middle ground than I was ever led to believe. It's a middle ground, but to continue your bridge metaphor, it's like a bridge where parts of it are wood and parts of it are steel. And it's like this weird amalgamation of both. Like it, it has its foot in both sides of the Bond camp, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's like if you went to a, a like Cedar Point like you know amusement park and you got on a ride that was half modern steel and half <laughs> old school wood, and you're like, I don't really know what's happening here, but I'm kind of having a good time, I, I think. <laughs> Brad, as I think about this season that we're currently in, and folks, if this is your first time listening, welcome into the show. This season, we are focusing on the highest grossing films from the years spanning 1988 to 2019. Now, this was not the highest grossing movie of 1995, but it was darn close. And I think we've already reviewed. It was like either Apollo 13 or Toy Story. It was one of those films. It was those two. Yeah, we've already done those ones. And so the next one down the list was Goldeneye, which is awesome because it continues our streak of films in the genre that we call dudes rock. And (laughs) dudes definitely rock in this stretch of the 90s, Brad. We have for eight seasons tried our hardest to not come across as film bros. And I think we have gone so far the other direction that we've come out not as film bros, but just as bros. Like we are just in the (laughs) in the camp of Michael Bay is awesome. Like, I don't know how we arrived here, but that's where we're at now. And uh, to help us on our journey today, Brad, we have brought in one of our favorite guests. It is the renowned film critic and writer Bilga Ibiri. Bilga, how are you today? I'm good. I'm having a, a little nostalgia trip. You were just talking about. You know, what a great time it is to be alive right now watching these movies. And all I could think of was, man, it was a great time to be alive when these movies were coming out. Of course, I was in college (laughs) and right out of college at the time. So I, at the time, thought um, it was, you know, these were the worst years of my life. And now I look back on it and I was like, my God, I would (laughs) I would probably kill several people to be able to go back in time to, to those days. 
You know, I was I was young. All my, all, you know, I was hanging out with my friends. We'd go see Cliffhanger in the theater. You know, stuff like yes. that. Yes. Oh man, there was a stretch of mediocre action oriented films in the '90s that I look back on with so much nostalgia now, because they seem like masterpieces in retrospect. Like where where is today's Dante's Peak? Where is today's Daylight with Sylvester Stallone and Volcano with Tommy Lee Jones? Like these are. These are just cornerstones of the genre. I used to make so much fun of Daylight. I like Daylight was one of those films that I that I that, you know I preemptively hated before I even saw it. <laughs> I don't even remember what I thought of it when I saw it. I was just like, no, 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 no. I just bought a Blu-ray of <laughs> Daylight. <laughs> it all comes full circle, Bilga. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, this could easily devolve into a commentary on current <laughs> cinema, yeah, uh, and how good we had it back in the day. But I, you know, I don't know if we fully want to dive into that. Bilga, I'm curious. You had your, you know, the pick of the litter. Mm-hmm. You you saw the season. What made you go, man? If I could talk about any of these 32 films, Goldeneye is the one. <laughs> Well, I'd already done a podcast about True Lie, so that was that was out of the question. <laughs> um, Goldeneye to me is is a, a great movie to talk about so many things, um, so many things that are that are topics I love to to talk about. I mean, among them the James Bond series, which is you know something that like I started watching those movies when I was very young. And then have continued to watch them and, and have obviously gotten to the point where I'm now writing about them and sort of speculating about where they're going. And also I did multiple sort of uh, multiple rewatches of the James Bond canon, quote unquote, um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, I, you know, years ago, I mean, quite aside from the fact that I'd, I'd watch them as they were coming out and occasionally rewatch them. Um, some years ago, I did a small list for Vulture of... Um, well, I did a couple of different Bond related lists for Vulture. This was this was, you know, like 10 years ago or so, maybe even longer. Um, and I rewatched most of the films then. And then uh, over the years, um, I- I've shown them to my son. So I rewatched them with my son. And then several years ago, when No Time to Die came out, I did a full ranking of the Bond movies and I rewatched them again. And what was interesting was, I mean, I've seen the films and I have pretty good memory of them. So it wasn't like... I had to watch them to remind myself of them. It just felt like the world was changing so much that every two or three years, I felt like I had to rewatch these movies to make sure that I wasn't, you know, (laughs) if I may say so, that I wasn't like um, putting at the very top of my list some movie that people now find like incredibly problematic or, you know, I didn't (laughs) want to put like You Only Live Twice at the top, which is, an amazing movie in certain ways and a not so amazing movie in other ways. Um, Some of these movies date more than the others. Um, But just, you know, I wanted to rewatch them for those reasons, but, but also because I still love the films, even the, even the bad ones. And also my opinion of them changes too. Like for many years, I I would have told you, if you'd asked me what the worst James Bond movie was, I would have said, no doubt Moonraker, like terrible movie, you know, low point of the series, low point of the Roger Moore era, blah, 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 blah. But like every time I watch Moonraker, it just gets better and better, you know, and then other and then other Bond films that I always kind of held very high sort of shrink into the distance a little bit. You know, they're not the masterpieces of the series. There are other kind of real gems hidden out throughout. Um, So I change the culture changes and the movies change in certain ways, too. So I love revisiting them. And, And GoldenEye is great for those reasons, in part because it is a reboot and people don't think of it as much that in those terms because of what came later with Casino Royale and, and a much bigger sort of re- rebooting of the series with uh, the Daniel Craig films. But GoldenEye was the first time they really did that. Like you don't get Casino Royale without GoldenEye and not yeah. just because Martin Campbell directed them both. Um, and I love Martin Campbell too. He's someone I've interviewed and I love talking about Martin Campbell because I do think he has a very, uh, special place in action movie history. Um, also, this period is fascinating. I mean, the, the post-Cold War period where sort of the the classic international villain types are, are receding into the background. 
And there's this, this is all illusory, of course. Within six years, the world completely changes again and, and resets. But but it does it does affect the cultural products that come out, especially the pop cultural products mm -hmm. that come out, mm -hmm. like action movies and James Bond movies specifically. Um, so anyway, the, the Golden Eye is a great prism through which to discuss all these things. It's also just a fun movie, yeah. you know. Well, with all that historical context, Brad, I think it is time for us to throw over to you with our first segment of the day, which we call Brad Explains. Brad's going to give us the movie plot with only 60 seconds ticking on the clock. So let's go ahead and hear your take with this little segment that we call Brad Explains. Rob, Brad Explains. This, go is ahead. A, this is a Bond movie. How, <laughs> how much explaining can I really do? <laughs> well, let me let me give the spiel. So Brad Explains is the part of the podcast where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. And it has been established, Brad. This was your first time seeing Goldeneye. Oh, yeah, it sure was. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of when Brad watches movies from my childhood <laughs> for the first time. And so now, if for no other reason than that, I'll, Brad, I'll say I'm going to make you do this today. Yeah, no, you can. I'll say this, though. This is a very unique position. I don't think I could have ever said this before. I vaguely knew the plot of Goldeneye before I ever watched this film. And I'm assuming you can guess the reason why, Bob. Uh, because you played the video game. Because I played the <laughs> heck out of the video game as a kid. Which genuinely, like, not, I've never thought of this until this very moment. That's kind of weird. Like, mm -hmm. how often do you know a decent amount about a movie before you ever watch it because you played a video game? <laughs> like, I've not been able to say that about a single other of the 250 plus movies we've watched for this podcast. Brad, as you will remember, I got big into the Super Nintendo when we were in college again. It had a resurgence in our dorm room and I it bought sure a copy did. of the Jurassic Park SNES game. Bro, what a game. Let me tell you, I lasted all of 43 seconds in that game before yep. a Velociraptor would eat me every single time. <laughs> There's like, I don't even know what the game is about because I could never make it past the first room full of raptors. So yeah. it sounds like you at least made it far enough in Goldeneye to glean something about the plot. And you're going to share that plot with us now because you have one minute on the clock to spoil this film and go. Bond mission goes poorly but he accomplishes it and he loses a friend Trevelyan see remember remember the names <laughs> a bunch of years later uh the same bad guys get a space laser to do a EMP pulse which seemed like really wild at the time uh, I, I love old movies and the bad guys and there's a woman who can kill people with her iron thighs and <laughs> <laughs> just crazy stuff happens, Bob. Yes, that, that's 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 the movie. OK, uh, first major question after that very clear <laughs> explanation of the film. <laughs> Did this movie account for more sales of Jane Fonda workouts and Suzanne Summers thigh master workouts and Richard Simmons videos? Once people saw the results of the iron thighs. Easily. I, have we done I, a study to to track sales of these items? Yeah, I have no, no doubt that that, <laughs> <laughs> that iron thigh sales surged after this film. Oh, my gosh, man. OK, so as you said, Brad, this movie is a bridge between older Bond and what we would come to refer to as like the modern gritty Jason Bornified Bonds of the Daniel mm -hmm. Craig era. Now, I, I do think we are slightly skipping over in the post Roger Moore era. You got two movies. I think it was two with uh, Timothy Dalton in the late 1980s when Bond was really heavily influenced by Joel Silver <laughs> and like the <laughs> lethal weaponness of cinema. They were much grittier. They were the first R rated Bond films like significantly more violent than what we're used to seeing with Bond. And so even this reset in the early 90s, it returns a little bit of the camp elements. It returns a little bit of that sort of uh, Adam West Batman zaniness to it all. And I'm wondering, Brad and Bilga, you know, looking at it now, almost 30 years on, do you feel like this 
honors the spirit of the bonds that came before, but also what's it like watching this having just come out of this like insanely realistic, gritty born era that we've just come through. I'll, I'll give my answer first because Bilga needs to have the last word here. Clearly. Uh, <laughs> I would say, based on my memory of watching the the probably like four or five of the old Bond films as a kid, I actually think that this like hit the nail on the head. I, I don't know of many franchises that have you know rebooted, which is seems pretty often nowadays. I have I have not seen many that capture some of the spirit of the goofiness from the earlier films. But genuinely take it into a more modern feeling, darker, uh, more serious direction. I, I, Bob, I actually really enjoyed this movie. <laughs> it's funny because I because I I rewatch these films over and over again. I never feel like I'm I'm in the midst of any particular Bond period, especially now. Now that the Daniel Craig era is, I think, effectively over. The thing I the thing I remember though is you know Pierce Brosnan Pierce Brosnan seemed like the guy who was going to become Bond in the eighties uh, you know when he was doing Remington Steel and I remember this was a thing like every, I mean I was a I was a kid in the eighties and I remember we all said oh he should be James Bond and and I gather that he was going to be James Bond but he couldn't get out of his Remington Steel contract and so by the time so and we all knew this we we knew that. Pierce Brosnan was like the bond that never was. So then when he took over Goldeneye, took over with Goldeneye, I remember at the time we thought, oh, Pierce Brosnan, like, like it's, it's too late for that because Remington Steel was, was long over, if I remember correctly. Um, and it seemed almost like a desperation move to bring him in at that point, which I gather, having read a little bit about it, sort of was because like mm-hmm. Timothy Dalton was going to do it and then he wasn't going to do it. And then they were like, and then he was like, okay, fine, I'll do it. But they, they were like, we need you for five movies. And he was like, get the f*** out of here. You know, so, and, it, and they finally, they finally went back to Pierce Bros and I was like, hey, do you want to do this? Um, and, but it helped so much that Pierce Bros and of course, to, to us at the time, it was like, oh, he's older. He's an older Bond, which is funny because like <laughs> Roger Moore was like 85 years old or whatever. <laughs> But 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 like Roger Moore never I mean, aside from a couple of jokes in like the last couple of movies about his age, you know, he was never presented as a gritty guy. He was pre- presented as a kind of um, I mean, he was a cartoonish Bond sort of still doing the old Bond things, but acknowledging that he was creaky, whereas this seemed like a, a warier, tougher, grittier Bond just by virtue of the fact that Pierce Brosnan just read older Mm-hmm. Um, at least for people like me who were like, you know, in their early twenties and watching Bond movies. Um, so, so that added, that added a certain element, but it was also this fact that, you know, the, you know, they've, they'd always tried to reinvent Bond and, and you're right with, they, they did that with Timothy Dalton. And I remember it was a disaster. Um, like nobody really liked those movies. I think they, they have a sort of a retroactive, um, appreciation of them. And, and I've come to sort of enjoy them as well. They're interesting. They're, they feel more like, big spy novels than they do frothy bond movies mm-hmm. um but but there was something about timothy dalton that that didn't read right as bond he wasn't sort of he didn't have that like effortlessly suave quality he seemed to be trying a little too hard it was a little too intense right and and as a result i think one of the reasons why we always forget those movies it, it's funny because Nobody forgets On Her Majesty's Secret Service, even though that was like totally abortive and George Lazenby just did one movie and then they brought back Sean Connery. Um, like nobody forgets that one because in so many ways, despite despite some unique qualities, it does feel like a Bond movie. Mm-hmm. Whereas License to Kill um, and um, Living Daylights, right? Um, yep, yep. No, sorry. Yeah, Living Daylights. Um, th- those, those films don't feel like Bond movies in certain ways, which I think probably freed up the folks who made uh, GoldenEye. They could still bring a certain element of that grittiness, but then throw back a little bit, right? So it's it was like they jumped off 
with the with the D- Timothy Dalton movies, they'd like like jumped off a cliff into a completely new thing, and suddenly somebody was no no no, we got to build a bridge, <laughs> right? <laughs> to continue the bridge metaphor. Um, but it was like there wasn't a bridge before. It was yeah. like here's the Bond movie where uh, you know Felix is half eaten by sharks. You know, mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. really <laughs> that's gonna happen now. Um, and now now it was kind of like okay no 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 like let's let's step back a little bit. There's there's a sex crazy uh, thigh killer on the loose. Like that's much more. <laughs> that's much more in the bond. That's, that's our speed. Bond. That yeah. right. Sex crazy like, there would never thigh have been, killer. <laughs> yeah, there would not have been a sex crazy thigh killer in uh, in the, the Timothy Dalton movies. Although I I will say, Golden Eye is sometimes presented as like the first James Bond movie that didn't you know. Um, that didn't use any of the Ian Fleming novels and that it was like completely original. It's not completely original. The plot is basically Thunderball, mm-hmm. um, which is also, by the way, the plot of Never Say Never Again. And there's also like Barbara Carrera in, um, Barbara Carrera as Fatima Blush in Never Say Never Again, which is like the Bond movie, you know, nobody talks about because right. it was produced by right. a different studio. She is the original Famke Janssen. I mean, that that she is playing a very similar part in that movie. Um, yeah. And uh, and so it's funny when people say Golden Eye is like a total original. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> like, it just it just regurgitates a lot of the same things from other Bond movies. It's just, you know, it doesn't quite nod to them as overtly as the way the others did. Yeah, I've always thought that it's funny how the Bond eras, if we can call them that, get entangled with the actor that played Bond so much that like we put. Obviously, we put the success of the movie on that actor's shoulder, and that that makes sense. Yeah. But but also like the overarching, the kind of narrative that they tell, the arc that they take, the trajectory of all of those movies gets placed on that actor as well. And I've always found it odd yeah. with the Pierce Brosnan movies because it felt like we were kind of doing this analysis of his films in real time. Because yeah. from the first one in Goldeneye to the last one he does in Die Another Day, he did four Bonds, and the the acceleration into camp was swift. Like by the time you get to die yeah. another day, it's like, you know, the man's just like surf hang gliding on a glacier and like, you know what? Cool. I went and saw it for my 12th birthday. I had a blast. But like, I always thought that we read the trashiness of those movies back onto Pierce Brosnan in a way that was never earned. Because I got to be honest mm-hmm. with you guys. I, I know that I grew up with him as my bond as a kid. I still think that aside from Connery, Pierce Brosnan might be the second most successful actor at playing Bond. I think that he he has something that's kind of needed in Bond, which is like all respect to Pierce Brosnan. He doesn't have the broadest range as an actor. And I think that like there is something about the sort of um, not woodenness, but like aloofness of Bond that gets called out by characters like M. And and even like Sean Bean's character, who is like constantly critiquing, hey, James Bond, you drink too much and you're sleeping with women to fill a void in your life. And they cut back to Pierce Brosnan and it's like dawning on him for the first time that he's doing this. And I think Pierce Brosnan's kind of the perfect actor to put in that position because he's not introspective the way a Daniel Craig is. He At the end of the day, yeah. he's still going to go back to doing James Bond things. And so I really love, aside from Connery, I do think Pierce Brosnan is just consistently hitting exactly all of the notes that you need a James Bond to hit. Yeah, like you're you're not going to oh, ask I... a Benedict Cumberbatch to play. <laughs> no, no, right? Like, no, he's got too much going on in his eyes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's the other thing is that in many ways, Pierce Brosnan is my favorite Bond. He's not in my favorite Bond movies. I mean, I, I love Goldeneye. I love Tomorrow Never Dies. I actually think Tomorrow Never Dies is the best Pierce Brosnan Bond movie and one of the best Bond movies. Didn't really get its due in its day, but I think people are, I'm hoping people are rediscovering it, you know, also because of Michelle Yeoh and stuff. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But then he does The World Is Not Enough, which is horrific. <laughs> uh, and then Die Another Day, which is which is bad, which is which is terrible. Um, and, and he, I mean, so he winds up with like, he makes four movies which doesn't feel like a lot. Uh, two of them are like among the worst Bonds ever. But then the other two are Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies. But because because he ends it on Die Another Day, which which a lot of people really hated for a variety of reasons, um, 
it's like his legacy as Bond is kind of tarnished as a result. And he didn't have enough of the early, like, you know, Roger Moore had a few stinkers too, but he was in so many Bond movies that like anybody can point to like, oh, but this one's great and this one's mm-hmm. great and this one's great, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. He is, he is sort of perfect and he's, he's not, I mean, they're all limited actors to a certain degree. I mean, Daniel Craig is probably the best actor uh, to have done Bond, but Daniel Craig is is a, is a great actor, and and he brings his his talent and his depth to Bond, um, but almost to a fault, like mm-hmm. because because Timothy Dalton is a great movie star, right? I mean, he he knows his limitations, he uses his limitations. You, you know, the thing I always say is a great actor uses their their skill and their and their range. A great movie star uses their limitations, right? Yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger knows his limitations and. He's a movie star because he stays within, you know, within that, within that, um, within those parameters. Um, whereas, um, you know, I, I think you're absolutely right with Pierce Brosnan in, in, in that he's, he's totally, totally right for the part. And that little self-awareness combined with woodenness is perfect for Bond, mm-hmm. is absolutely perfect for Bond. Bilga, I, I'm almost, I'm a little ashamed to ask this. How many Bond movies are there? I, I just all I know is <laughs> the answer is a lot, but what's the specific to a lot? <laughs> oh my! I don't even I don't like I got to look up my list to see. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. I'm, either, I'm glad. It's either twenty five or twenty six now. Okay, and That's I don't know if they count that. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't know if they count the the one random one that Sean Connery made apart from the official ones. So, and Wait, Casino, Sean... the first Casino Royale too. I don't know. Sean Connery made a Bond film that's not a Bond film? Yes. So that was what uh, yes. what Bilga was referring to. Never say to. never oh. again. Um, oh, so hang on. This one does... Uh, um, I'm looking at the list I did, uh, which has 26 entries. Um, but I can't remember if... I think that list does not have No Time to Die on it. Mm. Because, um, because, you know, it was like a ranked list before the... Uh, Hang on, I'm just I'm scrolling. Oh no, it's there. Okay, so it is 26. Maybe maybe when people say 27, they're counting, uh, you know, the the, sure. the funny Casino Royale movie that got made. Yeah. Um, Brad, I keep forgetting that you know when you ask Bilga like, hey, what's the number? And then I'm like, oh, I'll be helpful and and offer what I think it is. I forgot that Bilga literally wrote the list of That's, Bond movies. Like, <laughs> there's a he's like, let me I check asked... the list that I wrote in a yeah. national publication. Sorry, but, but, <laughs> there's a no, reason I like, asked it, Bilga, not you, Bob. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's funny because it's like they go through period. I mean, especially with like the the pre Brosnan period. I mean, they go through periods where they don't do one for a while. Yeah. And then suddenly. It, Suddenly they have a new bond and they're like churning them out or you know, quote unquote churning them out. And there are periods when there's one every every couple of years, you know. Um, it's funny. I mean, No Time to Die was supposed to come out in 2020 and then COVID hit and it got delayed to 2021. We're now in 2024. They haven't even cast a new bond. It's mm-hmm. going to be several years before we get a new one. Um, yeah. So it'll, it'll have been a long wait. I was going to say, I remember during the early Daniel Craig years, it, it felt like every other year. For a few years there, it seemed like there was a new Daniel Craig Bond film. They all, other than Quantum of Solace, it seemed like they all did really well at the box office. I'm sure Quantum did fine well as well. But yeah, it seems like they definitely go through those those stages of like, let's get out four or five while we have Daniel Craig in his prime is what mm-hmm. it felt like. So to continue our bridge metaphor, to push this metaphor even further, you know, Bill is absolutely right, though, in that. It seems like they make them in these these rapid bursts and then there's long stretches. And so they kind of seem disconnected from time to time and and from bond to bond. But there are often actors and characters who tie together these many eras. And I think a good place to start talking about this cast outside of Pierce Brosnan is with one of the smaller roles in the film, but with one of the most important. And that's Judi Dench in her first appearance as M. And man, oh, man, does she make a first impression? Because I have to say, Brad... (laughs) You know, I watched this movie front to back for the first time maybe two years ago. I went on a big Bond kick, and I tried to fill in a lot of my blind spots with the Bond series. And full transparency, I remember most of the action set pieces from my watch just a few years ago. There is a lot of filler in this movie that I completely forgot about. Yep. 
And Judy Dench's scene with Bond sitting in her office and just needling him is perhaps the best scripted and best acted scene in the whole movie. It is just like a Cracker Jack performance, man. It's so good. It's incredible. I, I will say, uh, so there's the character of Money Penny and mm-hmm. then the character of M, which I remember when I was a kid thinking was one of the dumbest decisions like you could make. <laughs> it always confused me. Uh, in this film, <laughs> no joke, when Money Penny came on screen, I like obviously she looks nothing like Judy Dench. Mm. Her voice sounds almost exactly like Judy Dench because <laughs> she started talking to Bond and I was like, hold on a second. I know that Judy Dench was younger when she made this movie, but I don't think she was that much younger. And it genuinely took me aback. I didn't even she... notice that. I'm going to have to go oh, back and listen dude. now. Go back and listen. I legitimately was like, that's not Judy Dench, but that sounds like Judy Dench. Uh, long story short, I was a big fan of Judy Dench when she came on screen because she can act circles around just about everybody in this movie. Maybe Sean Bean could give her a run for her money. Because I, I think he's really solid here as well, but man, she is the best. Yeah, no, she's she's terrific, and um, and it, th- there's a reason why they kept her on as M. You know, after they, you know, Bob Brosnan left, and and they went with uh, Daniel Craig. It, it, it's you, know, you mentioned Money Penny. I mean, there's this this exchange with Money Penny, which is such a perfect encapsulation of like the the bridge that we're talking about. I mean, the sort of straddling, you know, the two sides of bond, you know, when she says, you know, this sort of behavior could qualify as sexual harassment, right? And, you know, what's the penalty for that? Someday you'll have to make good on your innuendos, you know? And it's like, that's such a great line. Right. It could go in so many wrong directions, yep. right? I mean, it yep. could become like a whole thing. It could just be, you know, we're just going to shit on James Bond. And it's like, no, <laughs> you know, this is Miss Moneypenny. This is James Bond. They have a thing. It's now 1995 and we're going to acknowledge that, but we're not going to turn Money Penny into like something else. Yeah, That's, exactly. Like you audience have come in to – to this room to see a James Bond movie. We're not going <laughs> to on you, you know? Um, I was going to say, honestly, Bilga, that's that's kind of where I fall with a lot of this movie, where mm-hmm. the, they do a, a pretty good job in this film of using the innuendo to color in the blanks. And, and, and not, like, innuendo just in a sexual way. Like, the innuendo right. to what James Bond has been in the past, mm-hmm. just enough in little jokes that they give or visual gags or even in the way he saves the day a few times, feels like an innuendo on who Bond was. But then they continue to stamp like their own unique twist on the violence and, and you know, what, what the bad guy's trying to do and, and certain things mm-hmm. that. That just really, I, it stood out to me. Yeah. The, it, it's funny, the um, seven, eight years ago, maybe longer, um, I did a I did a piece for Vulture. Again, another list, but this time I, um, I went through the Bond movies and all the ones that had um, a financial crime associated with them or, or somebody trying, like some of the Bond movies are like, crazy man wants to destroy the world, whatever. But, but, but a lot of them are also, you know, X mastermind wants to, you know, make a, make a billion dollars, um, or steal a billion dollars or whatever. And I actually did a piece where I, I fact checked these with, they never want to make the money. Honestly, it's always that. <laughs> no, no, it's James Bond. You know? Um, but I, um, but I, I, I fact checked it with a, with a world bank economist. My dad, uh, my dad is a retired world bank economist and I had him, uh, call one of his friends um, who, who I got on the phone with. And we went through the the various financial schemes of, of these Bond villains <laughs> and explained which ones made the most sense, which ones would actually conceivably work. You know, like Goldfinger's plan, which is to basically um, irradiate, you know, the gold at Fort Knox so that his gold becomes gains value. Like that could work, mm-hmm. you know. Um mm-hmm. My favorite was when he explained that what they're trying to do in Goldeneye 
it would be kind of a disaster because they're like stealing all this all these British pounds. But they're also destroying the British economy. So they're going to lose like all that money is going to immediately lose value. Right. But also, like, what are you going to do? You've just destroyed the UK's economy. You're now going to go around trying to spend British pounds like (laughs) you'd have to convert that money. And actually converting such huge amounts of money is actually not that easy. It's not an instant thing that happens like. You know, believe it or not, the the world economy is an incredibly complex thing. And, you know, this whole like, we're just going to steal all this money. You're not going to steal all this money. It's just shit on a computer. And <laughs> you're going to wind up having to like turn that into money somehow that you can actually use that has value. Anyway, uh, uh, GoldenEye you- was among the worst ones. <laughs> Are you trying to tell me that the man who associates himself with a thigh assassin might not be thinking logically about things? I know. I, I well, but the thigh assassin works, you know? Sure. The thigh assassin is <laughs> brilliant. We have, we have evidence of that. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. Um, Multiple dead but, bodies. Uh, yeah. But it is but it is such a such a 1995 Bond kind of thing. I mean, all, all the Brosnan movies are kind of... I mean, except for Die Another Day, which is, you know, that that period when like every movie, the villains were the North Koreans, because that was like the one country left that like you could sort of <laughs> depict as villainous. Right. Um, but, you know, it's it's such a it's such a strange thing. Like at this time, I remember this is like we're on the edge. We're on the verge of the tech bubble. Right. It starts within a couple of years. And then, you know, obviously it all melts away in 2000. But like people are becoming more interested in financial matters and things like that. Um, like th- that kind of stuff is entering pop culture a right. little bit. Because um, uh, there's a bit of that in the next one, too. The world is not enough where they have kind of a Rupert Murdoch type character mm-hmm. being played by Jonathan Price. Um, so, you know, this is like the that's the other thing about the the Brosnan movies is that he never really had like a great villain. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, I mean, they, they had great actors doing these parts and they were interesting, but he never had like kind of the great. Um, I mean, Connery had Spectre, of course. Right. Uh, right. And, 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 and Goldfinger. And Goldfinger. Yes. And and then um, and and Roger Moore had an assortment of flamboyant crazies who want you know, the, the, the guy in Moonraker, the guy in Spy who loved me and, you know, and. <laughs> In Katanga and Live and Let Die, um, you know, like um, or um, and and the man with the golden gun, he had yeah. Christopher Lee, you know, yep. who like acts him off the screen, uh, you know. So, like, he had great villains, individual villains. He never fought Spectre, um, but Brosnan didn't really have the great villains, and I think that's also something that he suffers from a little bit. His his Bond corpus, if you will, suffers mm-hmm. from not having particularly great villains. Or great sort of Bond villains, right? I mean, yeah. Tomorrow Never Dies is the one that kind of comes the closest, really. I, mean, I don't know if this is a good... When you said that, it linked in my brain to you talking about the 90s finance villains, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it made me think of a movie like Fight Club, where mm-hmm. right at the end of the day, we're destroying all these banking institutions and it's all about the money. But at the end of the day, the villain of that movie is himself, And it feels like maybe in the 90s, we were starting as a country to move away from all of these other countries are bad guys. We're actually the bad guys. Right. And I, you know, I think we've kind of definitely swung that way in the last 10 to 15 years. But I wonder if uh, Fight Club was kind of hitting on the cultural moment a little more deeply than Goldeneye. (laughs) Uh, is that well, crazy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that's a stretch, Brad. Let's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was going to say know. though, like to to Bilga's point, I actually think that this hits on two characters, and let's start with Sean Bean as the Bond villain in this movie, who was a uh, who was a double O. He was double O six, but he was secretly a villain the whole time. And uh, here's the thing about his character is that. I think sometimes the the truly great Bond villains fall into one of two camps. Either they are like just fun evil or they are like sympathetically evil. And not that you sympathize Mm -hmm. with them, but you at least understand their motivations. Like I think about uh, Javier Bardem in Skyfall. Like he is just so freaking good. But you understand what drove him to the point of madness. And it's this, you -hmm. know, the idea of Judi Dench as mother and everything else. And you kind of have the same thing here where 
a, a, a genocide of sorts against his people was committed. And he wants to get back at the British for what James Bond admittedly says was, quote, not our finest moment, you know, and like yeah. very much, very much the truth. That's but, a British but, way of saying, like, <laughs> we, we effed up we real bad. Up. <laughs> but it is a paradox to me because he is one of the more sympathetic or understandable Bond villains. But his character is just so bland. And Sean Bean mm-hmm. is a great scenery chewing villain in hundreds of movies. And yet I don't feel like he really leaves that much of an impression as an overall, like if you're making a ranking of Bond villains, I don't know how high he would fall in the list. No, he wouldn't. He wouldn't fall that high on the list. And um, it is interesting that you mentioned that because I'm I'm going over the Bond villains that came prior to him and trying to find someone who maybe also had that sort of sympathetic edge, because this was a thing in the nineties to concerts, you know, the villain who you sort of understand, Mm -hmm. right? The villain who is, you know, demonic and must be destroyed, but also like has a legitimate gripe. I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm blanking on some, but I don't think there was a Bond villain like that before. Afterwards, we get a bunch of them. Um, And I think that's, that's interesting too. Um, But it is, it does speak to that moment where, you know, there is a certain self-reflective quality to, to some of these villains. You mentioned Fight Club. Um, you're absolutely right. There is this process that starts around now of action movies and, and you know, or pop culture, uh, pop cultural products where we're a little more inward looking. That There's a pause that happens, though, when September 11th happens. And then there's this period of, you know, good versus bad. And then we get the fantasy movies, right? I mean, also, we we stop getting actual action movies. We get Lord of the Rings and we get Harry Potter. And, you know, we get we get the the Marvel movies and everything. But eventually those two sort of slowly find their way towards introspection, right? And now we definitely get so many action movies where it's like, who is the bad guy after all? You know, you get, you know, <laughs> no, but uh, you get something like yeah. Black Panther where you're like, well, oh, Killmonger yeah. has a, had a point, you know? Um, we do get some of those. I mean, look, you know, I will always mention Michael Mann, right? Michael Mann is very good at that stuff, right? I mean, we get less of the Mohicans well before all of these and it's like, Mike was got a point, you know? Um, yeah. So, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's rare in these films, especially not a thing you expect to see in a Bond movie. And Bond movies can be very, very interesting gauges of, you know, the cultural temperature um, because they have a very good idea of where the limits are. They're never going to push against the limits. But when they do something, when a Bond movie does something, you know, oh, this is like mainstream now. Like this is yeah. a thing you can put in a Bond movie and it's OK. Um, so, yeah. Here's here's a question for you as a as a Bond certified uh, I was about to make a pun. Uh, bondified. I get it, bonafide. <laughs> You're a bonafide yeah. Bond expert, Bilga. Th- this might be a dumb question. Who are the caretakers of the Bond IP? Because like you just said, like, you know, once they decide that this can make it mm-hmm. into a Bond film, it must be culturally relevant enough. Is it just like the the CEOs of the studio that owns the IP like who who's been the caretaker over the last 20, 30, 40 years? Well, it's Eon Productions. Um, and it's, you know, Albert Broccoli, um, who's the producer of the Bond movies. And in fact, Goldeneye, I believe, was his last one. Uh, and then Barbara Broccoli, who I think is his daughter, um, and Michael Wilson, who's her partner in this. Um, so they've they're sort of um they sort of oversee it. They're the ones who make the decisions. They're the ones who, you know, will cast the new next bond and stuff like that. Um, and they have a certain amount of freedom under the studio. I mean, it was MGM UA and then, um, or it was United artists and then MGM UA. And, um, now it's Sony, right? It's Sony, uh, but also Amazon. Right. But, but like, but it was funny because when Amazon bought, you know, the, like there was this assumption, oh, Amazon's Amazon controls Bond now. Not really. Like Eon still controls Bond. Like Eon makes the decisions about Bond. And yeah, and they've been, you know, they've made lots of not good movies. Um, and they've made all sorts of decisions that I maybe don't agree with all the time. But they've managed to shepherd Bond 
in interesting ways. I mean, the Daniel Craig era, you know, I mean, Bond movies were not like that before, right? The Daniel Craig era where it's like you have through lines going from movie to movie to movie and there's this sort of arc. I'm not a big fan of that type of stuff, that type of continuity where it's like, I don't, I feel like I'm watching an incomplete movie if I haven't seen the others. Um, at the same time, they did kill him off, so now they can do whatever the hell they want with the next one, which which I think is kind of brilliant, actually. They're like, okay, well, well, that James Bond is dead, and we're going to start over again. Just completely start this again. This guy could be completely different, you know? Yeah, it's a multiverse now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know, exactly. But but I love the fact that, like, I love the fact that there isn't a lot of canon in, in, uh, in James Bond movies. I yeah. mean, there are elements that have to be in all of them, or almost all of them. I mean, there are elements that we expect, but there isn't a kind of, like, no, 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 James Bond can't do this because he did this in the other movie. Like, no, stop, get out. Like, that's not, we don't do that in Bond first. Like, you can call out to another movie, but it's not like, yeah. Well, guys, I think this is a good place for us to hit pause. I'd said a bit ago that we were going to talk about two characters, and we hit on one of them. The other is, I guess, what we would call the Bond girl of the movie, who is very 90s in her own right. And we'll talk about that when we come back from break. But Brad, it is time for us to try this Saints Alley Nobleman. What do you say we drink some whiskey, man? Let's get to it. All right. So today we are checking out a whiskey called Saints Alley, colon, The Nobleman. The Nobleman. Now, Brad, this is a whiskey that you provided to me from a friend uh, that gave it to you as a sample. I had never heard of Saints Alley before. And I got to be honest with you, man. Uh, for a guy that is chronically online and chronically on whiskey Instagram, to have never heard of a brand is a major feat. So uh, congrats yeah. to you and your friend. So uh, it seems like you've contradicted the COS, chronically, chronically online syndrome. <laughs> I guess so. I'm not online enough, it seems. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, from good friend of show Wes. He provided quite a bit of whiskey that we're going to see on this season of the show, and I think we're starting off with a good one here, Bob. Yeah, so I did a little bit of background on this company, and it turns out that the head distiller at a distillery in Texas called Iron Root Republic, his name is Jonathan LaCarish, he paired up with a guy named Chris Trevino, who's a pretty big like whiskey influencer and writer. Uh, They got together, they started talking about whiskeys that they loved, and they kind of hatched this plan to start a finishing series. They took a trip over to Cognac, France. They learned about distilling and blending techniques there, came back to America and started Saints Alley, which I'm not sure if it's 100 percent under the Iron Root Republic umbrella, but it is certainly made in collaboration with them. And so today what we're drinking in this uh, The Nobleman, it is a combination of MGP rye and Iron Root Republic's rye that is then finished in Tokai casks. Now, Tokai, which is T-O-K. A-J-I is a Hungarian sweet wine. We have had Mm. one other whiskey in the history of this show that was finished in Tokai barrels, uh, and we were huge fans of it. So I'm really, really looking forward to this one, Brad. I don't have an age statement on this, but it does seem like it is 107 proof. So, you know, it's got some nice body to it. It would probably be freaking great in like a Manhattan or something. Mm. I, I can't wait to dive in, man. Now, you've already tried it. I'm drinking it live today. Yeah. And as I got into the nose on this, it had a lot of the every single classic note I'm looking for on a rye, but but like deep and beautiful. There there was some brown sugar. It it kind of smelled like fresh fresh bread. The rye notes were coming through. There's a lot of nice vanilla. Um nothing surprising here. But all of it was like a really nice version of something I want to sp- smell on a rye whiskey. Uh, so I give it an eight and a half on the nose. Yeah, I really like this a lot, man. Uh, the rye grain is really present here. It doesn't mm-hmm. smell young. But to your point of like the breadiness, I get a lot of rye bread here. Typically, our rye, you know, at least for you and, and I and our our palates, we'd say that our rye typically fall either on the dill side of things or the Mm -hmm. mint side of things. Yeah. I think this tips a little bit more minty. I don't get as much sour notes on this, but it is. It's underscored with a really nice layer of vanilla. There's some dark fruits, almost like a pruney kind of scent to this. I like this a lot. I think I'm going to give it an eight and a half as well, Brad. Yeah. And as as I got into the palate, Bob, this is where it really popped off. For me, it's like a salted butter. There's the rye spices that come in. There's some clove. 
Uh, the palate for me is where that nice sweet mint really came into play. And the longer I, I drank it, the more sips I took, the more I really got a really nice, rich caramel cheesecake sort of vibe. This is a hell of a rye whiskey, Bob. It's not the best I've ever had, but it's a 9 out of 10 for me on the palate. I think I'm going to go at an 8.5 here, Brad. There's not quite as much sweetness as I was expecting from the nose. It got almost a little bit tannic to me, which I think may be the wine influence on this. But it has like a really nice, dark, tannic, red wine, almost earthiness to it. It's just mm. like it, you get a little bit of like rye and dirt. It's a very manly rye. And I really, really like that. But it is underscored with these layers of of dark stone fruit. I don't know if I would call it caramel, but there's definitely like some brown sugar here. Uh, I, it just smells like uh, like stewed prunes. I don't really know what else to, to call it here. <laughs> it's really, really nice. I'm going to give it an 8.5. Yeah. And on the finish for me, it, it softens a little bit. Being at 107 proof, I think this has like a perfect uh, feeling finish. That warms you, but doesn't overpower you. Uh, the oak comes through. There's a bit of a white pepper vibe. And here's where I start to get into that fruity territory, where when, I, when I'm when i done drinking it and it's just kind of sat there for a few minutes, you're right that there's a lot of really nice uh, ripe fruit notes that I'm getting. All, a little bit of like a dark cherry prune is a good note. I am a big fan, Bob. Eight and a half. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite red wine, Brad? Um, I, there's a, there's a local winery that has a American heritage, um, kind of dark, um, dry red wine that I like, but in general, okay. I lean towards dry reds. Okay. Yeah. I, I think that this finishes like a dry red mm-hmm. mixed with rye. Like it, it is exactly as advertised the rice, like not rye spice, but the rye grain is left behind on the tongue along with some of that really tannic, uh, red wine character. It's really beautiful. I would never have pegged this at 107 proof. You know, we don't really like to use the word smooth often on this show because bourbon bros get, you know, uh, <laughs> up in arms about it. But it does the finish boots. just so smooth. Like there's just enough alcohol character here that, you know, you're drinking a whiskey, but it does not. It's not harsh at all. It's mm-hmm. not astringent at all. Really well rounded. I think this is the kind of whiskey that's like an eight and a half across the board. Which is kind of spectacular. Usually when something is a blank across the board for us, it's like a 7 out of 10 across the board. Yeah. If you can do every category at an 8.5, you've got a damn good whiskey. And so far for me, every single category is an 8.5. Yeah. And that's why I gave it a nine and a half on balance. I think that they take the flavors. They don't make the most complex rye whiskey I've ever had. But every area that they try to enhance, they do well. Mm -hmm. And so I I think this is one of the best balanced whiskeys we've had all season. You know, I don't really know a lot about Iron Root Republic, but the Texas whiskeys that we've had, Brad, we've been really hit or miss on because there's a very distinct character to Texas whiskey. And it doesn't just have like that quote unquote craft whiskey feel. But more than maybe anywhere else in the country, I think that like you can really start getting into conversations about terroir when you talk about Texas whiskey. Like there's just something in the dirt out there that makes their whiskey <laughs> taste different. And I'm wondering if that earthiness comes from whatever amount of Iron Roots uh, rye is in this blend. It's really nice, man. I, I think I'm going to be just a hair beneath you on the balance. I'm going to give it a nine out of ten on balance. I did not look up any pricing information on this, so you're going to have to surprise me here, Brad. What does this sell for generally online? Uh, I found it at a few different places right around the $80 price point. Hmm. And honestly, at $80, I think this is actually a pretty good value. Yeah. You know, it, like for about $95 to $100, you are going to get Barrel Seagrass, which I think is probably the best rye out on the market right now. And so this is, you know... 20 ish dollars cheaper and nearly as good in quality. So I, I'm actually going to give this an eight and a half out of 10. Uh, I think this is yeah, a good quality. I, I mean, especially like when you are finishing in something as obscure as Tokai barrels, like I'm just automatically expecting this to be near the triple digits. So $80 from a small kind of startup craft distiller, you know, producer, I don't think that's bad at all. Again, $80 is more than I would spend on most whiskeys, but the, like the price is justified here. So I'm going to give it a 7.5 out 
which brings me to a 42 out of 50. Brad, what are you coming to? Uh, two points higher, 44 out of 50. All right, that takes us to an 86 out of 100 or a 43 out of 50. Uh, far and away, our highest ranked whiskey of the season so far. Folks, if you're new to the podcast, it is really hard to break into the 40 out of 50 club. Yep. And Brad, as soon as you told me that you were a fan of this, I knew it had to be really good because you are a lover of rise. And mm. I think that you have a, I don't, I don't know if I would say you have a more discerning palate than I do, <laughs> but you're, you are a little pickier when it comes to what constitutes a good rye because you love them so much. Yeah. Yeah. This is definitely my wheelhouse, I'd say. In the world of whiskey and <laughs> St. Sally knocks it out of the park with this this offering. Well, we are kind of riding high today with our conversation with Bilga and with this whiskey. What do you say we get back into talking about Goldeneye? Let's get to it. All right, everybody. That was St. Sally the Nobleman. Mm. Bob. Mm. Come on. Good, good stuff, man. You Ugh. know, I tried to pair these things up thematically, and I know that, like, the story of James Bond is that he is the opposite of a nobleman, <laughs> but he's such he's such a dapper gentleman that I feel yeah. like a whiskey called the nobleman just I mean, suited the occasion. How many noblemen in history were truly noble? Yeah. You know? James, James <laughs> Bond is more noble than any nobleman we know, so there you go. <laughs> Oh, man. Bob, I am really excited to see where we go with today's two facts and a falsehood, because for the third week in a row, you have a guest to help you out. Well, let's get into it, man. This is two facts and a falsehood. Brad is going to try to stump you, Bob, to our right. And what is wrong? Two facts and a falsehood. Two facts and a falsehood is the part of the show where Brad presents me with three items about the making of this film. All three are presented as fact. One is actually a falsehood, and it's up to me to determine which one that is. Brad, I am sitting pretty at like four and two, five and two on the season now. Yeah, you're killing it, man. I'm doing pretty well. Uh, so no pressure, Bilga. But here are the rules for two facts and a falsehood when I have a guest at my disposal. So you will be my my lifeline, my phone a friend. If I seek your help and we win, I only get one win in the win column. But if we lose, I am double penalized. I get two losses oh, shit. if we guess okay. wrong. So we don't, we don't mess around. Bill, yeah, yeah, man. Now, I will also say Brad introduced a new wrinkle just last week where I sought the guest's help and then did not go with his answer. And Brad told me that even if I chose not to go with the guest's answer, just seeking his help oh. meant that I would get two losses if I guessed wrong. So uh, I think what what's happening here is Brad's starting to get desperate, and he's just looking no, for ways I mean, to to punish me. I've watched. Maybe I should make I, little visual uh, gestures if I know the answer. So. <laughs> you gotta have you like t tug on your earlobe and stuff. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say I grew up watching Regis on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. And if you phoned a friend and guessed something different and it was wrong, you still lost. Well, you yeah, were out. I mean, that's it's a completely different game, Brad. We can't make comparisons like this that. This is basically the same game, Bob. <laughs> All right, man. Hit me with your two facts and a falsehood. Fact number one. During the filming of the iconic bungee jump sequence at the start of the film, Pierce Brosnan performed the jump himself without the aid of a stunt double. This was an unprecedented move in Bond film history and added an extra layer of authenticity to the scene. Fact number two, Sir Roger Moore paid a visit to the set to see his son, Christian Moore, who was working as a third assistant director. He quipped that early tests of Pierce Brosnan hadn't worked out, so he was brought back. Fact number three, Goldeneye is the nickname of James Bond creator M Ian Fleming's beachfront house in Jamaica, where, between 1952 and 1964, he wrote the Bond novels and short stories. Okay, I am pretty sure that number three is true. Because I remember Googling, like, James Bond, Goldeneye, and there was an article that came up, and it was called, like, Ian Fleming and Goldeneye. And it was a picture of him on the beach. So that sounds right. Nailed it. I'm immediately gravitating towards number one, Bilga, and I'll tell you why. A, uh, just so much liability if my man jumps off of a dam. But also, at the very end of the jump... 
where he like shoots his little Batman gun and anchors himself to the ground and then like slowly lowers himself in. It's it's very clearly a green screen. So like maybe Pierce Brosnan did the part of the jump where he was actually jumping from 12 feet off of the ground and they and they green screened him. But I just that one sounds really, really false to me. And the Roger Moore one, by comparison, sounds like something that might have actually happened with Roger Moore. Uh, I am going to seek your help just because I like hearing your input. So if if we're going down, we're going down together, man. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? I agree with you uh, for, for two reasons. One is we don't really see. I feel like if Pierce Brosnan had done that stunt himself, they would have. We would have seen a lot more of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, it doesn't sound right to me that, you know, this was the first time a stunt like this had been performed by the actor. It just feels like I'm like, wait, I mean, they were performing stunts all the time. What does that mean, a stunt like this? Um, and and also, I think I agree with you about, too, that does sound like something Roger Moore would have said. Um so I think I agree with you. I think I think it's number one. Now Brad and has three been is definitely known, correct. We know three is correct. Yes, Brad has definitely been known to uh, make up a very innocuous sounding fact because mm-hmm. it flies so under the radar. So two could mm-hmm. be the 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 one. But I'm gonna I'm gonna lock in number one as my answer, Brad, because we've got the confidence of me and official Bond ranker Bilga Ibiri behind me here. <laughs> Is that is that Bilga's new title at all? Yeah. Is, is that his yeah, new it's, it's, his it's new on the byline his, now. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was gonna say it's his yeah. new byline. <laughs> <laughs> official bond raker. Bilga Beery. Uh Bilga Beery, official bond raker, ranker, is also correct about this two facts and a falsehood. All right. Six and two on the season, Brad. Dude, you are running away with it. This is my new strategy. It's called bring. A, a, a plethora of experts on in a row to help build a lead, an insurmountable I say, lead. I was getting well, ready for this one, and I was like, "Man, Bilga, I feel like is just gonna know everything." <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the thing, the, the the thing that I thought about with number two, and I thought this would have been really devious, um, and you should have done it, <laughs> but but I thought to myself. <laughs> I was like, this sounds like a true anecdote. So it doesn't feel made up. But I was like, but it's also something that could have happened on another movie that he brought in. Like it could have happened on License to Kill, you know, mm-hmm. um, or it could have happened on any of them. Um, but it's it like, you know, it feels like like it has the texture of a real anecdote. But I thought it, yeah. could, it could have been really devious to like have something that actually did happen. But but. Move, Bilga, change the movie, you know. The reason I don't do things like that is because <laughs> I would never hear the end of it from Bob. He would <laughs> whine and complain he's, for weeks he's not on wrong. end. He's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> if I were to do something like that. No, Brad, you have to be original. Make it fully up yourself. <laughs> All right, guys, let's get back into talking about the movie itself. And we left off. About to talk about the Bond girl of this movie. Her name is Natalia in the movie. The actress's name is Isabella Skorupko, who I do not know outside of this film. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I will say that similarly to Sean Bean's character, I don't feel like we really remember this Bond girl as a Bond girl. And it's partially because... She, she's she's one of the most helpful Bond girls in the history of the series. She is in many ways Bond's equal throughout this film. And, you know, I know they tried to do this with like Denise Richards in in later Pierce Brosnan movies and in ha- with Halle Berry in Die Another Day. But what's really brilliant about this character is because she is a computer scientist, which is clearly something that Pierce Brosnan knows nothing about. Like this James Bond does not know a computer at all. She really brings a whole series of skills to the table that come in handy in ways that are like Bond can't take subtle digs at her. Like she is not the the butt of a joke in any way. And I found that incredibly refreshing, but it also, you know, I guess it, it it's not a good thing that this is the case. It also feels very out of place in a Bond film 
to have the female lead <laughs> be so much James Bond's equal. And I'd love to hear what your guys' thoughts are on this character. Well, it feels like she's the expert in her field. He's the expert in his. And they need both of those skill sets to beat the bad guy. Mm -hmm. And you're right, man. That's not a common trope within the realm of James Bond films. I mean, it was it was I, much more similar to like what we saw with, you know, a, a season or two ago, Brad, we reviewed Edge of Tomorrow, where like mm. Tom Cruise does his thing, which is like mystical ability to wake up every day. And Emily Blunt does her thing, which is actually be able to fight well. And they are equals <laughs> throughout the movie. And so they develop a chemistry and a romance, but it's it's its own thing. And the way that these two develop a romance is much more akin to that than the the uh, seduction that James Bond typically employs, which which he does at the start of the film. Yeah. Right. He has a psychological evaluator and he <laughs> sleeps with her. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and I, yeah, I, I really like her in this film. I think a, as per the use, the script doesn't do anybody in this movie a lot of favors but it doesn't do her a ton of favors other than like setting her up as the expert when it comes to the actual lines that she's given and the the arc of her character that you know it's a little bit flat mm -hmm. but I, i'm okay with it because she she brings something that you don't see in other bond films i think i think you're absolutely right one thing i i remember from you know from my childhood and and, and later as well is Every time there's a new Bond movie, there was always some kind of TV feature. I mean, this is back when we had TV shows like Entertainment Weekly and or Entertainment Tonight and stuff like that. But um, there was always a report that was like, well, this Bond girl is different. She's not like the other Bond girls. <laughs> and they did that for every single one of them. Um, yeah. And I remember, I remember them. I remember very vividly the reports about how this Bond girl was not like the other Bond girls. And because they always do try to find something, not always, but like, and it's not always, I mean, the, the Bond girls have, there's certain things that, that need to happen for someone to be a Bond girl, right? Right. Um, right? There's certain traits that they have, <laughs> and there's certain things we need to see in the movie from them to qu qualify them as Bond girls. Sure. Um, but within those parameters, they're always trying to find ways to make them unique, uh, or interesting in some way. And that I think has actually benefited the Bond girls over the years in that some are better than others, you know, for a variety of reasons. And I agree, like Isabella Skorupsko's character isn't necessarily the most memorable of Bond girls, but they all, but they are all interesting characters to a certain extent. Like they do get dimensionality, a little bit of dimensionality. They get backstory. They're in a, they're in a situation, right? And and she, especially in this one, is like, she's in a situation. She's in this place that's been, like all her friends have been massacred. She's like trudging through the snow. Um, you know, like she 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 gets stuff to do. And I think that just helps build characters so that they do eventually become they do feel like real characters, which is not a thing that people think of with Bond girls. Right. They, they, they're supposed to be interchangeable and whatnot, but they're not. They're not really interchangeable. I mean, some of them are, I guess, but especially earlier in, in, in the series. Um, but after a certain point, you know, even the Roger Moore ones, I mean, you know, the Roger Moore films, often people see those as like the most problematic of the Bonds. Roger Moore had the best Bond girls because each one had a story, right? I mean, whether it's in Spy Who Loved Me or For Your Eyes Only or, or Octopussy, like he actually had like the best Bond girls and the most interesting and the most kind of dimensional Bond girls. Sure. Um, and, you know, I think Isabella Skorpko's character um, kind of fits in that in that mode. Now, one other thing about her character, and I think this relates to the film in general, and this is one of the reasons why it always kind of stands out for me among sort of the other Bond movies. You know, there's such a I mean, Bond movies are founded on him going to, quote unquote, exotic places. Right. Uh, and there, there's a lot of eye candy in Bond movies, not just not well, not with the women, I mean, but like with the kind of, you know, very escapist settings and stuff like that. What I love about Goldeneye is, you know, this is like post-Soviet Union Russia and like the settings, there's nothing exotic about the settings. I mean, the settings are like, you know, 
giant bureaucracy filled with papers and files, <laughs> uh, you know, gray yep. Soviet apartment buildings, like the, the, the color palette is gray and brown and black. And, you know, like the train sequence is like this incredible looking like, you know, hammerhead shark of a yeah, locomotive yeah. being chased by a tank through just like the grimiest looking settings. Yeah. And then, you know, or like James Bond goes to meet somebody and it's in like a, it's at night and it's just a, a field full of like, abandoned soviet statues <laughs> like that's a like that's a unique looking bond yeah, movie for sure. uh like there you don't i mean you get you, later with the i mean they go to town with the daniel craig movies later but you don't like there's so much atmosphere in this film that's not like the atmosphere you expect from a bond movie and it's almost a joke when they finally go to cuba <laughs> Right. It's just like, you know, like you got five minutes of beach and all right, we get, we get Isabella Skorpko in the bikini. Let's get, let's, let's check that off the list, right. you know? And right. it's like, all right. And then, and then they go and it's like, they're fighting against the giant satellite dish. You know, there's nothing, <laughs> you know, colorful or exotic about it. But like, that's, that to me is Goldeneye, right? That's that, that symbolizes Goldeneye. The fact that it's all just kind of really kind of gritty and yeah. gross and everything's falling apart and, you know, He's being chased through like, you know, it's giant it's a much, stacks of paper. Yeah, know? it's a much dingier movie than I think we remember. Mm -hmm. Like it, it was sold as Dingy's this really, Lord, yeah. this really sleek new Bond. You know, we're not in the '80s anymore, people. And like to your point, like everything about it is just there's a there's a layer of coal soot on on everything that James right. Bond touches in this movie. Yeah. All right, guys, real quick. We are running out of time before we have to get into our, our last couple uh, segments. I have a list of notes on the, the rest of the cast that I just want to speed run through. Brad, I know that you have something that you want to talk about before we get out of here today. So let me just real quick. Alan Cumming, who has never been known to not play an over the top character. Uh, what do we think of him? Because he is a, a walking cartoon in this movie and he gets absolutely Jack Torrance by some liquid nitrogen at the end of this film in a way that it seemed very out of place for the rest of the film. Uh, Brad, what are your thoughts? Bob, you know how you talk about uh, in the like late, like, I don't know, like 2009 to 2014, it's a very specific era where mm -hmm. almost any like romantic comedy has a scene where a teenager is teaching their parent how to use like Twitter or Facebook. Yes. <laughs> right. Yep. I feel like the mid to late 90s through the early 2000s, any sort of action movie had a really crappy version of Simon Pegg from the Mission Impossible <laughs> movies. And yep, Alan yep. Cummings is that in this movie. Yep, 100%. Like you, yeah. you know that a movie is from the late 90s when there's like a hacker who's like this really scrawny, like can't get laid incel. <laughs> Yeah, T <laughs> with total like slob. with glasses, yep. slob. Yep, they're, they're, he's either really fat or really like mousy, yeah. skinny. Everybody's yeah. riffing on Wayne Knight from Jurassic Park in this, like yeah. in this kind of character. Yeah. yeah, it's it's wild. So that's what I think about Alan Cummings. <laughs> All right, second second question: uh, Joe Don Baker playing the CIA operative. Are we to understand that he has been embedded in Russia? Or was did he just happen to be visiting at the same time as James Bond? Because he is dressed in full Russian garb with the thickest Texas accent. I, I, I do not believe for a moment that this man can fool anyone when speaking Russian. And he's like so loudly yelling across Red Square to James Bond, like, hey, Jimbo, come over here and help me with this thing. Like I like the worst CIA operative I've ever seen in a movie. Like absolutely does not blend in whatsoever. And I'm here for it, honestly. That's when you remember these movies are made by Brits. <laughs> and the CIA agents in these movies are always buffoons who, yes. who who never actually blend in or anything like that. Um like I think that's actually like a British in joke that they that like the Americans are actually not very good at what they do. They're basically good for like weaponry and yep. you know get, getting Marines to Cuba at a moment's notice, which yep. you know is a thing they often have to do or Puerto Rico or whatever. Right, um, DEA agents, but but it's like 
Yeah, the Americans are not actually good at their jobs in these movies, for the most part. No, and we all sound like Foghorn Leghorn. So, uh, yeah. A fi yeah. final note is that I loved the era of the mid to late 90s where even the people with the smallest roles would go on to have big careers. You know, like you get Robbie Coltrane in here for a minute, who is just mm -hmm. hitting like way above like his pay grade in this movie. He's unreal. You get Minnie Driver as like his mistress for four seconds. Like I, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wait a minute, that's Minnie Driver. And I didn't realize like this is before Goodwill Hunting. So she's not famous at all yet. And I was thinking like, mm -hmm. oh, she's just doing a cameo here. No, she just like this is the level of role she was getting in 1995. She, she needed five grand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah see. I mean, I think Robbie Coltrane did have a profile at this point because like was yeah. Nuns on the Run. Was he on and like that movie's. That movie's happened at this point, right? I can't remember for sure. Right, and I know that he so, had done like he he was he had done TV like on the BBC, like right. he was known in Britain especially. So like, cracker, right? Was he crack? Yeah, you know. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. all right, those are my notes on on the cast, guys. Any other notes on the acting in this movie? I think it is pitched perfectly for what the film is trying to do, but I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts. I would say about uh, Famke Jansen, um, who is you know. Who's great in the movie? Earlier, when you were talking about, um, you know, when you were talking about uh, Judy Dench being like, you know, the best actor, you know, in this movie, I agree because Judy Dench is great. But Famke Jansen is a great actress, and 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 I will say, I've seen her in a number of movies where I was like, wow, she is terrific. Because this was my introduction to Famke Jansen, and like, what an introduction! Every time I see Famke Jansen in a movie, I'm like, oh, she can like kill somebody with her thighs. <laughs> like, like I, that's a terrible thing to think. I'm sure it's like it's like a, a horrible thing to say, but like she's so good in this and so iconic that there is always a part. Of, like Famke Jansen has done such a variety of films, you know, over the years and has yeah. been very good and has a tremendous amount of range as an actor. But she's so good at, at Zenya on a top that there is a little <laughs> bit of like Zenya on a top tingle every time I see her, you know? Also, the joke that, that I think M makes about her last name being on a top is yeah. incredible. I think that's another reason why uh, Isabella Skorupko kind of struggles a little bit is because you have Famke just going all oh, out she's in going this for film. It. Yeah. I mean, oh, she yeah. is absolutely wild. And I think that causes her to suffer a little bit as a character because she's just not quite as uh, she's not asked to do that much. Right. This is a not uncommon problem with some James Bond films where there's like, you know, there's a there's a a female villain or, you know, kind of villainy character who sort of, you know, draws a lot of the attention from from the Bond but I mean, this happens in Never Say Never Again. We're like, you remember Barbara Carrera, and it's like, who was the? It was it wasn't Kim Basinger, was it? Um, but it's like the the Bond, the ostensible Bond girl in that movie is like you just forget about her completely. Yeah, yeah. All right, Brad, it's time to talk about tanks bursting through walls. Bob. The the yeah. best sequence of this entire <laughs> movie, bar none, and, easily. And here's the reason why. And not to go back to the MCU thing we talked about. 40 minutes ago, but like the MCU makes 25 movies in like an 11 year period because we can create massive worlds inside a computer now and none of it looks or feels tactile or real at all. And you need three or four years in between each James Bond movie because they have to rebuild Russian cities after James Bond <laughs> drives a freaking tank through them in real life. Like the shot of this car whipping around a corner, it's framed weird. And you're like, why is it framed so weird? What's that big wall back there? And then through that wall comes James Bond in a tank. It is the coolest thing I've ever seen, Brad. Yeah. If there's ever a dude's rule moment in a James Bond film, that's it. And I, I love it because that's the type of decisions that typify GoldenEye. And they don't always work. But at the end of the day, how many, you know, action movies have you seen a car chase in? Probably almost every single one. And in how many of those car chases is the hero in a Jason Bourne situation where he's in a crappy broken down car going down alleys trying to escape? Not Goldeneye, my friends. 
in Goldeneye, Bond is the one doing the chasing, and he's not chasing in a car. No, no. He's in a freaking Soviet tank. And it just made every bit of my soul so happy to watch. And even like we didn't talk a ton about, I don't know, kind of the we talked a little bit about the visuals of the movie, but the shot of the the train after the tank shoots at it. It looks like a demon flying out of hell. Oh, it's great. With like the fire, like it almost looks like eyes in the fire Mm -hmm. and it looks real because it's real and it it's incredible and everything about the tank was perfect in this in this movie. Bilgo, where do you yeah, think this would I mean, rank? I was going to say, Bilgo, where would this rank for you in your James Bond action sequences? Because it really is up there for me, man. I mean, it's it's a it's a great action sequence. Um, I mean, there are there are a number of other James Bond action sequences that I would rank above it, but but I I I love to see. And every time I watch Goldeneye, again, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's right, the tank. <laughs> and uh, the the way that like. The, the the way that like the, the the women look at him as he's doing like the you know because the, the, the cutaways to you know the, the people in the train they're looking at him and it's like there's just this like delight <laughs> the delight on their faces so it, it starts to achieve this almost phallic quality <laughs> like James Bond chasing <laughs> like the this enormous turret yeah. um it's just it's I mean, just and it's busting through like- walls. Yeah, it's always drawn like a North by Northwest. Yep, <laughs> yep, exactly. One hundred percent. Yeah, and North by Northwest was like an influence on the original James Bond. You know, so it's, there's there's like it, it all it it's all connected. Um, the other thing I was going to say was the point you made about you know the fact that they shoot these movies. I mean, if not always on location, location they shoot them in locations as opposed to you know a parking lot in Atlanta. Um, it's, it's something that over the years I've noted about James Bond films, you know, we often talk about all the problematic aspects of the James Bond movies and all that, which, which are, which are true, but there's also another way of looking at these, which is James Bond is one of the most popular international pop culture figures in the, like, People in other countries love James Bond, right? It's I mean, people, oh, it's, you know, he's a he's a pig-headed Western imperialist, blah, 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 blah. They love James Bond movies in other countries. And part of it is because they shoot these movies in those places, right? Mm. I mean, the the hotel in India where they shot part of Octopussy, like they still show Octopussy there, like all the time. Um, you know, I know. F- from personal experience that they still tell stories in Istanbul about now there have been multiple James Bond movies shot in Istanbul. They still tell stories in Istanbul about the time that for your, uh, that, that from Russia with love was shot there. Mm. Right. I mean, like these were like huge events because they go there and they do their scenes there and they're there for weeks and months and they employ local talent. I mean, it's actually a big deal. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of it's the nature of, budgets and the way studio films are made nowadays but like i feel like we've lost some of that quality that idea of like a production that goes all over the world and actually shoots in one place for a while and kind of absorbs the atmosphere of the place so that what comes up on screen actually actually conveys some of that and you know transports you like that's such an important thing and that's one of the things i miss not miss but that's one of the things that's missing from the marvel movies not all of them some of them are very good um but there's that sense of like, I mean, they're going all over the world and I have zero sense that I'm going to any of these places, yep. you know? Yep. Yeah. And that stinks. That really stinks because that's like one of the charms of like big budget studio spectacle action movies. Like that's kind of the point, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just you don't feel like I've been to any of these places, you know? Yeah. You can't fake that. No. Like it you comes can't. across in the movie. It's intangible. And it comes across even in the acting and the way they do things uh, that yeah. that feels so much more real. Well, and I think Absolutely. it says it says a lot about the tank chase sequence, Brad, that that is not even like the keystone action sequence of this. movie. Like, th- it's not the one that they were selling us on in the trailers, right? Like the big moment where the the satellite falls on Sean Bean at the end is like the biggest, most extravagant moment of action in the movie. 
But to us looking at it now, almost 30 years later, just the fact that they drove a tank through a real brick wall is like, wow, a wall. Like, and I think it's such a sad state of affairs that we can look at something that tangible, which in 95 was like the 11th coolest thing that happened in this movie. And now for us, we're like, wow, this is this is a top tier James Bond action sequence because the wall was real, you know? So what I hear you saying is, Bob, build that wall. <laughs> That's build exactly that wall what I only because if only so we can ram drive a, a tank, tank through it. it. Yes, yes. <laughs> but but it but it's true though. Um, and to their credit, the Bond films have kind of continued that idea. I mean, they've always been. I mean, they've always been a great showcase for stunts and things like that. I mean, they do spectacular things in these movies, and they do them. You know, like I mean, they. Yeah. A lot of the Bond films have had janky special effects over the years, but like, including they, they this do one. as much of them as they can. They, you know, but they do as much of them as they can. I mean, I'm, I'm about to write something about the Moonraker, the parachute fight yeah, in Moonraker, yeah, yeah. and it's like, I mean, there's a lot of janky stuff in there, but like, they did some of that, shit, you know, yeah. like, and it's and it's really, and I mean, other movies have done some of that stuff since, and. The ones that do it for real, like Mission Impossible or, yep. or, or Point Break, it really feels, you know, like it's still it still endures to this day. Uh, Mission Impossible yeah. isn't that long ago, but you know, it's like, um, I mean, what better example do you need of this stuff than the fact that like this this stuff that people did forty years ago still feels so visceral and real, yep. and the stuff they did five years ago with you know, with VFX. Now, there's a lot of really good VFX out there. I shouldn't, you know, I have, I have friends who are VFX artists. I mean, these are really hardworking people, but, but you know, but it takes just as much effort to get those things right as it does to get like a real properly done yep. stunt, right? That's the thing that people don't understand. It's not a shortcut, right? I mean, VFX is not a shortcut. VFX is a way of doing certain things that you cannot do with, with real people, right? You right. can't make Avatar with like the real settings and all that, right. but you can't do it. You need the VFX to do it. Right. Um, same with some, like some of the star Wars stuff and stuff like that. But, but, um, but, you know, but if you're just using VFX because you don't have the creativity or the knowledge to stage an actual fight sequence, well, you know, you're in the wrong business, Frank. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I was going to say, it's not when, gonna it comes, look good. Yeah. when it comes to VFX, I always just come back This might be the most film snobby thing that I say. I always just come back to Gone with the Wind. Like, when they're escaping Atlanta, and you have the shot of that warehouse on fire, and they're riding their wagon out of town in front of it, holy (laughs) sh**. Like, that thing is on fire. You cannot fake that. Like, it just is brilliant and one of the most beautiful shots in film history and now, and now, it just feels so real no you're absolutely right and the the film i always point to and this is i mean this film is i mean since we're talking about the soviets here a little bit um the war and peace the soviet war and peace yeah. which is yep. a film that had an unlimited budget um like i remember i i, I worked in russia on a film set in 1997 and i and i you know, we were, it was a big historical epic that, that we were working on. And I worked with a lot of like veteran Russian um, crew people. And I was asking them about like what they knew about war and peace. They, they None of them had worked on war and peace. Some of them had worked on like Tarkovsky movies and stuff, but they all like the legends of war and peace had obviously were still very much with them. And, and the thing I remember one of them said, cause I said to them, what was the budget on that movie? Did they ever kind of finalize like a budget? And he said, it had uh, what we like to call open budget, you know, and it's like <laughs> open budget. There's no budget. The whole industry works on it. We're making this movie now for the next couple of years. Who knows what it ultimately cost? There's There was no real budget. It was just whatever, you know, because it was like the Americans had made a very successful adaptation of War and Peace. King Vider had directed War and Peace, which had, which was a big hit in in the Soviet Union, and they were like, "We cannot let the Americans have the last say on <laughs> war and peace." The definitive war and peace. Everybody, <laughs> get in here. We're making war and peace. Uh, you know, um, but uh, 
where was I going? Oh no. So, so there's a, I mean, there's a great scene in that sequence, actually, the, you know, the burning of Moscow. Um, and there's a scene where, where one of the, one of the lead actors who also happens to be the director of the film, Sergei Bondarchuk and an actress, I mean, basically an extra they're, they're running through the burning city, um, looking for some, some, someone or something. I can't remember what the exact context is, but, but they're running through like these burning buildings and running around them and there's ash everywhere. And I'm watching this thing and going, Oh my God, that's real fire. They're running through. And you can see the terror on the actress's eye in the actress. Cause she doesn't have like a big part. This is like a small part. And it's like, and the person pulling her along is the director of the film. And I'm just like, oh, this is like him basically just grabbing her and running through the set because <laughs> there's no way she's she's going to do it if he's not there just like right, yanking right. her along. It's terrifying. <laughs> I mean, not that anybody should be doing that. I'm sure several labor laws would be, you know, the Soviet Union, the great hero of, of the, the working people. No labor laws in that country, you know. Um, <laughs> Well, but I'm, um but it but but it was but it's again you watch that scene today and it's like holy crap like yeah, i'm there i'm there they did it. it's terrifying yep. and i'm there they did it yeah and you only you only have to watch 7 hours of film yes. to find yeah. that <laughs> and and this happens in like hour 6 <laughs> you do have to watch like the whole thing to get to it <laughs> well on that note guys i think it's time for our last segment of the day which we call let's make it a double we're near the end of the episode, so thanks for listening to the Film and Whiskey Show. Let's pair another film with this one, even if it's struggling. It's the final segment of the day, now let's make it a double. Let's make it a double is the part of the show where we pick a movie to pair up with this one to make the perfect double feature. Brad, I'm going to throw over to you. We have not heard from you as much today. Bilga and I are over here nerding out about James Bond. <laughs> I would like to hear what your double feature film is for Goldeneye. Honestly, Bob, I, I was I was thinking through a bunch of options for this. Part of me wanted to pair it with a Mission Impossible film because I just think that they're just the duality of those two film franchises. Come on. But I'm not going to choose Mission Come on. Impossible. I want to pair this with True Lies. Oh, OK. Because more and more people <laughs> need to see that movie. I know that True Lies is a wildly popular movie, but I am new to it and I want everybody to see that movie. So go watch True Lies. I think watching that back to back with this would be a wildly entertaining night. I love that. Brad, I, I kind of want to do two movies. I, I was going to say, what were you hoping I would say? You, you were very clearly. Well, this is a great. I'll do it this way then. I was hoping you were going to say Austin Powers, International Man of Mystery. I've, I've never seen Austin oh Powers. Oh my gosh, man. Okay, that's, I, we need to just cancel the rest of the season and just watch Austin <laughs> Powers 18 weeks the, in a row. My quick one time, I remember Austin Powers being on cable when I was on my eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C., and it was whichever one where he was, Dr. Evil was trying to destroy Washington, D.C. with his laser. Mm-hmm. And mm -hmm. we just thought it was the craziest thing. Like, we're in Washington, <laughs> D.C. right now. And it just, that was wild. So that's well, the only scene I've seen. I think there is a, a fun think piece to be written about how the success of Austin Powers accelerated the James Bond, the, the Brosnan Bonds into camp because mm -hmm. they saw that people liked Funny Bond and then they tried to do Funny Bond and it didn't work. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to pair this movie up with a Guy Ritchie film from the 2010s called The Man from Uncle, which I thought was a drastically underrated film that I had a blast watching that is now, you know, perhaps even more problematic to talk about than most James Bond movies due to who's in it. Uh, but which is a, I mean, you get your Brits, you get your Soviets, you get spy stuff. It's funny. There's a good Hugh Grant performance. Alicia Vikander's in it. You could do a hell of a lot worse than pairing this up with The Man from Uncle. Is that a, a Kevin Spacey film? <laughs> no, it is not. It is <laughs> okay. it is an Army Hammer film. Uh oh. and if you if you're not familiar with his scandals, uh go look it up after the fact because that is we're not <laughs> wasting airtime on that. <laughs> no, nope, but don't need to. <laughs> Bilga, what would be your double feature with Goldeneye? You know, I I th I thought a lot about pairing it with another Bond movie, 
a couple of the ones that we mentioned, I thought, oh, Never Say Never Again or Thunderball would be interesting. Thunderball would be great because that's also one of my favorite Bond movies. But the movie I'm going to pick is uh, Mask of Zorro, um, oh, yeah. which is the film that Martin Campbell made after this movie. Martin Campbell is a guy who doesn't get enough respect, but the man made GoldenEye and effectively rebooted the James Bond movies. Then he made The Mask of Zorro, which the Zorro film had been something that everybody had been trying to make for years and years and years. And nobody thought it was going to be any good. Like a Zorro movie in this day and age, we're so much more sophisticated than that. And he makes The Mask of Zorro and it is just an all time banger of a movie. I mean, I, I, I rewatch it all the time. It absolutely still holds up, perhaps even better than it did back then. I mean, it's just it's just so good. And then and then he comes back and he, you know, reinvents Bond again. He directs Casino Royale. I mean, the man like, you know, like there should be statues of Martin Campbell as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, and I've interviewed him a couple of times and he's a, he's a very sweet guy to talk to. And, and you know, but, you know, he's, he's one of those filmmakers who's really good with action um, in part because he directs clean action you know he's not i mean he has a real sense of rhythm and a real sense of editing but he always makes sure that you know where everything is and what's happening at any given moment and that's important for bond i mean there are some films where some action films where you can get away with just the sheer chaos of everything um and like like christopher nolan can get away with like many many great scenes in the dark night where you don't entirely know what's happening but but it mm-hmm. but it kind of works mm-hmm. um but martin campbell is like the opposite of that he's like okay this guy is here this guy's here he's gonna run this way and that guy's gonna run that way and you know but he does that with such fluidity i don't know he's a great great filmmaker um you know mask of Zorro was a big hit as well so you know i was gonna try and find something obscure that i could pair it with and i'm like wait these movies are old as far as the rest of the world is concerned they are obscure you know <laughs> uh but anyway mask of Zorro. i mean you can have a really really good night for yourself watching golden eye yeah. and the mask of Zorro. all right guys let's give this movie some final scores i'll go first brad because i'll take 10 seconds to do it this is like a really solid seven out of ten like i thought about a seven and a half but there's there's just enough preposterousness to it that I'm like, it's an enjoyable seven. And I'm okay with that. Where are you falling on this one? I, I'm right there with you. I was kind of hovering a six and a half to a seven. I had so much fun with certain parts of this movie, and other parts did just drag a little bit for me. Overall, though, really fun film. I, I looked it up. This is the sixth highest rated Bond film mm-hmm. in the series. Um, so, you know, if there's 26 films, that's that's doing pretty good for itself at 7.2 on IMDb. So I, I think seven out of 10 is a good score. It's right in line with where a lot of people have it. Bill, I'm curious to hear where you would place this film. You know, I'm 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 close to you guys. I mean, I think I think seven and a half would probably be the correct for me. I mean, I want to say, eight. you know, when I look at my ranking, it's number 10. Um Oh, which wow. is which seems low because I do love it, but then like there's I mean I mean look I'm, I'm gonna read Tomorrow Never Dies. So the ones the ones ahead of it are in order: Tomorrow Never Dies, Goldfinger, Skyfall, From Russia with Love, The Spy Who Loved Me, Thunderball, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, and then my top two, which are For Your Eyes Only and Casino Royale. I can't I can't put it ahead of any of those. But I still love it. So, yeah, like it's like seven, somewhere around seven <laughs> or eight, you know, I mean, they're all tens, but but, you know, it's right. a seven. <laughs> <laughs> but among the tens, it's a seven. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, those are our scores on GoldenEye. It's a seven from me. It's a seven from Brad. It is a ten, but also an eight, but also a seven and a half from Bilga. <laughs> But we'd like to know what you guys think. Have you seen GoldenEye recently? And what kind of a score would you give it? You can find us on all of our social media accounts to tell us what you think uh, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube at Film Whiskey. Or you can jump onto our Discord. We are on here every single day talking to you guys, fans of the Film and Whiskey podcast. So if you want to join the conversation, you can find a link to the Discord at the end of every single one of our show notes. 
We want to say thank you again to our guest, Bilga Ibiri. Bilga, it is just an absolute honor and a privilege to have you here. Uh, what are you up to and where can people find you? I am still at Vulture, New York Magazine. Best place to find my writing is to just go to vulture.com and poke around. Usually I have something up. Um, I'm on Twitter at Bilga Ibiri, B-I-L-G-E-E-B-I-R-I. Um, and that's about it. You know, I, 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 every once in a while, something by me will show up somewhere else, you know, like the Criterion Collection or something like that. Um, right now, I'm in the midst of writing something. I don't know when this will go up, but right, right, I'm in the midst of writing something about Tenet uh, right now. So, but that'll probably be up by the time by the time this this episode comes around. Brad, next week we are diving into a film that was for a time when I was seven, my favorite movie of all time. And that is the Jeff Goldblum, Will Smith banger Independence Day. I cannot wait to watch this movie with you next week, man. Bob, I've I've never seen Independence Day. I'm so excited, Brad. <laughs> this is the best season of our podcast by far. I, I'm so pumped about it, man. We'll see if you're still saying that by the time we hit 2019. But so far, even like Sister Act was oh, a lot of fun. The 90s, baby. <laughs> the, the 90s. All right, we'll see you guys next week for Independence Day. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. 